Imagine out there in interstellar space, uh, near vacuum, nothing much going on, just by random quantum fluctuation, we get we get uh, uh, intrinsic duplicate, physical duplicate of me, my brain, inside a a uh, Boltzmann brain, a Boltzmann brain. But no, we'll have it kind of hooked up to. Uh, 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 computer so that I mean when well, it be a belt and braid, but it's going to have the same it's, it's, it's going to have a it's going to have a, a sensory cortex and a, a motor cortex and it's going to have the same uh, afferent signals and efferent signals as my brain has for about 20 minutes or so I'm inclined to think along with some but not all representationalists that that being will have just the same sensory experiences as me it's got just the same physical goings on as I have going on inside my head. I take it that's enough to give it the same conscious experiences. But I say in that being, the conscious experiences won't be representing anything. They won't be representing anything any more than uh, 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 a picture of Winston Churchill drawn on the mountains of Mars by random Martian winds represents winston churchill it's just or or or, or the, the words elvis once visited paris drawn on the the hills of mars by the wind do not represent anything they're just a random arrangements of of bits of sand hello my geeselings it is mother goose robinson Earhart here with the introduction to robinson's podcast number 90 and this episode is with david papineau who is Professor of Philosophy of Science at King's College London. And David is a prior denizen of this Robinson's podcast, Multiverse, as he was my guest on episode 62, which was a totally awesome episode, as is this one. And in 62, we talked quite broadly about the philosophy of science, though more particularly, we talked about realism and anti-realism within the philosophy of science. But in this episode, we talk about the content of David's most recent book, The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience, which is linked in the description. And I have to mention, please leave reviews, comments, likes, subscribes. Those are always so appreciated. And without any further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I enjoyed having it with David. Last time, Dave, we talked uh, a bit about your background before we got started, but something that we didn't touch on. So naturally, in our last conversation, it was mainly about philosophy of science and scientific realism, but you've also worked in the philosophy of a number of different topics. You've written a lot about naturalism, about consciousness, about sensory experience, which we're going to talk about, uh, philosophy of sports. And I was wondering if there's something beyond just general curiosity that you see as unifying everything that you do in philosophy. Funny question. Uh, Hi, Robinson. I see. Uh, Let me just think about that a bit. I think the reason that the question comes to mind is I did an episode with uh, Frank Jackson and Graham Priest that's going to come out in a few days, all about the philosophy of David Lewis. And he was a very programmatic philosopher where everything tied together. And so I've just been thinking about different philosophers and the way that they approach the subject and their research. Good. I'm not sure. I mean, I... I kind of came into philosophy because I was curious and uh, curious about how things worked, about how people worked, about how society worked, uh, about how the world worked. And uh, I'm still kind of curious. So I I find I've got a rather roving philosophical eye. I mean, I I turn from one topic to, to another. But now you ask about, do I have a program behind it? Uh, I think perhaps you can see some 
some common themes. My first book, my very first book, was called For Science in the Social Sciences, 1979, I guess. And I mean, my first job, I was lecturing in a sociology department. I taught the, the methodology course. I did that for four years, and that the, that turned into the the book and the general line I pushed against all kinds of Wittgensteinians and uh, Verstandmongers and so on was that social sciences did well to be scientific. And I didn't especially think of myself as laying out a program, and that's just what I seemed true to me. But in retrospect, uh, that's run through a lot of my thinking. I mean, I'm a philosophical naturalist. A naturalist is somebody right. who thinks that uh, in philosophy, somebody who thinks that philosophy is uh, continuous with science. And so mm -hmm. the, you know, the naturalism, the, the scientific uh, way of knowing is the only way of knowing we need. I think that runs through my thinking a lot. Uh, Physicalism. Physicalism only came later. Uh, I, I, I mean, a natural thing to become if you're a if you're a, a naturalist. But uh, it wasn't a big thing when I first started doing philosophy in the seventies, and uh, a lot of my early work it doesn't scarcely figure at all until until around nineteen ninety. So, uh, yeah. Maybe that's yeah. I was wondering if that... I'm a nat I'm a natural born naturalist. That's what it is. Yeah, I was wondering if that was what you something along those lines was what you were going to say because you mm -hmm. have the sort of canonical book on naturalism, and then in our last episode, if I'm quoting you correctly, mm -hmm. you said that you felt philosophy was in the business of. Uh, you didn't say pumping out, but I'll say pumping out, producing good synthetic theories of the world. Mm -hmm. And I mm -hmm. see that as sort of the the operating program behind your work. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. absolutely. So I, t today I wanted to turn to, I think it's your latest book, The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's it's just a couple. Yeah. 2021. So no, I, 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 I've written quite a few books, but I don't read, write that fast uh that's why i said read this because i think you have a famous famous joke uh there was this figure in the scottish enlightenment called Mombodo, and he used to, and he grabbed hold of some lord and said lord so and so have you read my latest book and the lord said no my dear man you write a good deal faster than i can read but uh uh uh, no, so I'm not like that. I don't churn out the books that fast. Uh, two, 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 two years ago, uh, I haven't had time to do another one yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I thought a good place to start would be clarifying just what it is we're talking about when we talk about sensory experience and maybe how sensation is different from some somewhat similar terms or terms in, in the same area like perception or cognition. So perceptual experience, how does that differ from sensory experience? The term perception rather than sensation has, has two different connotations in the philosophical literature, philosophical history. Uh, one of which, uh, well, both of which I wanted to avoid. That's why I said sensory experience. But uh, let me let me say a bit about about both. So, one difference between between talking about sensory experience and perception is perception is a success verb. If I have an illusion or a hallucination, I you know I see this uh, cup to be blue and it's in fact white, then I'm not perceiving it to be blue. I'm not perceiving its blueness, even though I'm having a sensory experience as of its being blue. So uh, I used the metaphysics of sensory experience. I could have said the metaphysics of perceptual experience. 
and indeed the term perception sometimes used to cover what are called the bad cases of illusion hallucination as well as the good cases of ridicule perception but kind of strictly speaking it shouldn't be used like that i mean I'm not perceiving when I have a hallucination. I'm not perceiving when I suffer an illusion. Anyway, so so that, that that's that's one issue. And when I called it centric experience rather than perception, it, it was just to emphasize that I was uh, interested in what's going on in the bad cases as well as what's going on in the good cases. Uh, I mean, there's some views. This is one of the issues in this area. People think that there's no common conscious factor between the bad cases and good cases. Uh, I do think there is a common, we'll, we'll probably come on to this, I do think there is a common conscious factor. But when I said I'm writing a book about sensory experience, I wasn't yet in the title presupposing that consciously the illusions and hallucinations were uh, uh, one with the vertical perceptions. I was just signaling that I wanted to be talking about all three kinds of cases, not just the, the accurate perception. So that's one connotation of perception as opposed to sensational sensory experience. The other connotation, which doesn't really figure in my book very much at all, is that there's certain philosophers, Kant, Reed, who kind of think that there's the raw data of sensation and that that only turns into something representational structured something that lays claim to the world being thus and so when it's infused with concepts that come from outside the realm of sensation uh, come from come from cognition come from higher higher mental faculties and i don't think of sensation as being itself impoverished like that i think that what goes on in sensory experience is already representational quite independently of the presence of higher cognitive faculties animals animals who arguably don't have higher cognitive faculties don't have concepts i still think have representational experiences i don't really believe in this idea of the the raw data of experience that need to be shaped before before they present the world to you. I don't, I, I, I'm not sure there is such a thing. So, yes, does that answer your questions? I still haven't explained the difference between perception, stroke, sensory experience, and cognition, but that's another another issue. No, but you've, you've already raised some really interesting points that mm -hmm. I hadn't considered. So one, the first, I just want to clarify to make sure that I'm following you. So when you distinguish between good cases and bad cases. So perception is successful if it's accurate, but to talk about the success of a sensory experience is just a category mistake. Sensory experience just is, and success doesn't really enter into the picture. Is that an accurate I, way of interpreting? No, I think if sensory experience is going to include vision, hearing, touch, I think of it as uh, representational. I think that sensory experience per se represents the world to be thus and so, independently of what beliefs you might have, what cognitive states you might be in. And uh, and so, given it represents the world to be thus and so, uh, it will either be uh, accurate or not, ridicule or not, true or not. And so, uh, I'm very happy to talk about a fallacious sensory experience and an accurate sensory experience. Uh, here's here's something that will bring bring out the point. I mean, not in a conclusive way, but will. Take the Muller liar lines. You know the, the the arrows. How do I draw it? A line, two lines. One's got yeah. the arrows pointing out. One's got them pointing in. Yeah. And one one line looks much longer than the other, even though it's not. Okay, so there's a case where in 
my sensory experience, the lines look to be different lengths, whereas in my cognition, in my belief, I'm, I'm not uh, a naive uh, uh, person. I've seen these cases before. I, knew, I know the two lines are the same length. I know that I believe the two lines are the same length. I know the two lines are the same length, but there's something else in me that's representing them to be different lengths, uh, namely my sensory experience. And in this case, the sensory experience is fallacious. Uh, but uh, in other cases, when it represents two lines to be different lengths, it will be representing accurately. So that's what I think about your accusation of a category mistake. Do you do you feel better about it now? Yes, I I think I do. Okay. I do. And then... I, mean, I agree. It sounds a bit odd to talk about a sensory experience being true, but. Um, yeah, I mean, that's what I want to say. No, no, that makes sense to me. And then your second point about... Go ahead. Well, there's a further issue that... There was a time I seem to remember Oxford philosophers saying, look, vision and, and touch and so on, they're not sensations. Sensations are things like, like itches and dizziness and... Uh, uh, so sensations, the term properly used, refer to just kind of uh, feelings with no real content that weren't presenting the world a certain way. Uh, okay, I, I agree sensations in that sense are not true or false, but I'm using sensory experience much more much more widely than that to include conscious, conscious visual experience, conscious tactile experience, and so on. Mm-hmm. I suppose that what I had in mind was just like if you're in pain mm -hmm. uh, you you just are in pain there's no uh real truth or mm -hmm. or falsehood to it but I but I also get the point that it it could not be accurately connected to something in the world and like if you have phantom limb syndrome and there's pain there pain's so I think that we're on the same page yeah, no, pain's funny. Pain, pain is a hard case for the kind of thing I'm saying. I mean, just because pain is a somewhat non-standard uh, kind of perceptual experience, and we talk about pain experience and with a different structure from the way we talk about visual experience. I mean, what many philosophers, naturalist philosophers anyway, want to say at first pass is that pain states represent there to be damage in a certain part of your body. Uh, and uh, so that when you have a phantom pain or referred pain, uh, it's, it's inaccurate. The pain is inaccurate. But at the same time, we want to say, no, hang on, what do you mean the pain's, pain's inaccurate? It's still a perfectly good pain. It's perfectly real pain. I mean, the, the person who complains about, I've got a pain, please fix it. Uh, uh, is is talking about something that's there, whether or not it's whether or not it's accurate. And uh, uh, I think we talk about pains in a way differently than we talk about visual experiences, tactile experiences. But so let, let's put pains to one side. They they raise all kinds of complications. Mm -hmm. And uh, then your second point that you made about sensation not being impoverished. Contra philosophers like Kant, who yeah. thought that representation required the presence of higher cognitive faculties. Yeah. With, I mean, talking about representations in depth is a completely different can of worms. But can you give a simple example of what you mean to say that uh, a sensory experience is representational? Like maybe if I look at my cat and I have the sense impression of my cat, is it representational just in the sense that um, there's beyond just the sense impression, there's some content about an object, uh, a moving object. And even if I don't have the, the, the concept of cat, I guess. Uh,
You all thought was if beyond the sense impression, there's some representation of a moving object. I'm not quite sure. I mean, I just think the sense impression itself is a state that represents the world to be thus and so. So, okay. uh, I mean, it's easiest to think about it. it look, what what brings out? the way in which a state like that is representational is to think of cases where it misrepresents. So imagine, I mean, this quite often happens with cats, that uh, something, that you have a hallucination of a cat. I mean, it does quite often happen. Quite often. With a, a little black kind of shadow moving and you kind of look and you kind of, see cat. I mean, it's not a full-fledged detailed image of a cat, but okay. I want to say that you have just the same sensory experience that you have when looking at an actual cat, sometimes when there's no cat there. And in that case, you're suffering an illusion or hallucination. And uh, uh, i.e., you're misrepresenting the world to contain a cat when it doesn't. And given it's just the same state that you have in that bad case as you have in that good case, I say that in the good case too, you've got a conscious experience that's representing there to be a cat there. Uh, it's not like this is something over and above the conscious feeling that you have when you look at the cat. I want to say the conscious feeling just is a representation of the presence of a cat. Does that does that make sense to you? No, it it that totally makes sense. Yeah. And now enter the the title of the book, the metaphysics of sensory experience. So when we're yeah. talking about the the metaphysics of these sensations and the ex, I guess the experience of the sensations that they're mm. the same thing so that's kind of redundant. Are we talking about the ontology so what they are how we should fit them into the world or or how they behave causally or all these sorts of questions yes and and the reason i gave the book that that title is that a lot of people who work on sensory experience are primarily concerned or largely motivated by the implications of various theories of sensory experience for epistemology, for the possibility of our being in direct contact with the world, the possibility of our referring to items in the world. And I don't talk about those issues in the book very much at all. I just wanted to focus on the kind of machinery of sensory experience. What's what's actually there when we have sensory experience? What are the, what are the components of sensory experiences? And, and indeed, I mean, how, 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 how do they causally relate to other things and so on? Which is not to say that the implications for for epistemology and the possibility of reference to the world and so on are irrelevant. If I had a theory that that had ridiculous implications for those areas, that would be bad for my theory. But I didn't want to go into those aspects. I wanted to start off focusing on the machinery of sensory experience itself. Uh, I mean, I don't think the theory I have does have uh, ridiculous implications for epistemology or uh, the possibility of thought about the world, but um, I don't go into that in the book, and because it would require a much longer, much longer book, and I didn't have very you know, clear, detailed things I wanted to say about that. Uh, on the other side, I should say that part of the motivation for the title is I think a lot of the contrary views that I criticize 
have very bad implications for the metaphysics of sensory experience. They're committed to metaphysical assumptions that kind of make no sense to me. And uh, that was part of the reason for calling the book that as well. Yeah, well, let's uh, get into that. So there's a certain view that you characterize as naive realism in the metaphysics of sensory experience. Mm -hmm. And maybe we should start with what this is and how it relates to this interesting problem called the, the time lag problem. Good. Let me say before we go into this that uh, naive realism doesn't figure very big in the book. The main mm -hmm. uh, target of my negative arguments is representationalism, which right, is right. alternative naive realism. And, and then the second half of the book develops positive arguments. But I, but I do discuss naive realism. No, okay. Naive realism. Right. And I, I want to get to representationalism in the qualitative view. Uh, this uh, just seemed like the right place to start. Well, that, 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 that's, and, and, and it will help bring in uh, uh, representationalism. Uh, indeed. Uh, so the book starts with the question I have a conscious sensory experience. I have a certain, I want to put it in terms of my having a certain property, the property uh, of experiencing a yellow ball, say, uh, uh, understood so as to include the cases where I'm having a hallucination. Uh, and I want to know what kind of property is that? I mean, I think of states as a, a particular object having a property. So there's a state of me having this property of experiencing a a yellow ball. What what kind of state is that? What kind of property is that? Okay, the naive realists say that that state is constituted by my being in relation to a real yellow ball. Think of the case where there's a real yellow ball there. Uh, my eyes are open. Uh, uh, there's my field of vision. There's a yellow ball in it out there, you know, two feet away from me. My conscious state is constituted by my being in the relation of seeing to that yellow ball there. There's a fact out there, the ball is yellow, and I'm glommed onto it. And a consequence of that is that the naive realist will say that in the case where you're hallucinating, or uh, maybe it's a perfectly good ball, but, it, but it's green and not yellow, that you're not in the same conscious state. So many people would think, uh, many common sense, I mean, ordinary people, not philosophers, would think that, that I can be in just the same conscious state when I'm looking at a real yellow ball, and in the bad case where I'm hallucinating a yellow ball, uh, when there's no yellow ball there, I'm an illusion, there's a ball there, and I, it's blue, and I see it as yellow. Uh, it's just the same conscious experience. I mean, look, the ball feels yellow, right? Uh, naive realists, uh, deny that. They want to have the idea that conscious sensory experience puts me in real contact with the world out there. The world there is part of my conscious experience. And uh, I mean, they're motivated, as well as referring to, I mean, that, that we're going to be in trouble if we don't have this real contact with the external world. We'll be cut off from it. We'll never be, skepticism will come in. Uh, we'll never be able to talk about it. We, you know, they're worried that we aren't in good enough contact with the world if we have a common conscious experience that goes across to the bad cases as well as the good. I mean, kind of thought, I mean, how would we ever know that we're in a good case if we had the same conscious feelings in the bad case as well? That, that's, what's, that's what's pushing them. And so they have to end up denying that uh, – uh, it's a common factor, a common, common, fact, con, common conscious factor to the good veridical cases and the bad uh, uh, delusory cases. Uh, and, okay, that's naive realism. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I say in the book, look, I, I, I don't aim to be contributing to literature on naive realism. It's, it's a very popular theory in my country. Uh, it's not so popular in the States, but there are, uh, Berkeley uh, is pretty strong on naive realism. And uh, 
I didn't especially want to enter that debate, but I, I explained why I why I uh, uh, am unpersuaded by this view, why I reject this view. Uh, and what is the time lag problem? The time lag problem is uh, look a lot of things we see, especially celestial events, but not just those. Uh, events on the sun, events significant distance, now, all events come to think of it, uh, happened sometime before we see them. But the right. naivist wants to say that uh, my conscious experience is constituted by, by being in relation to a certain fact. And, uh, but if the fact happened before my conscious experience, it kind of looks like you've got to say my conscious experience extends in time to include that past fact. But I mean, I, I, the supernova occurs, I see it. I mean, not now, there's no supernova, but uh, 16th century, there was a supernova, people saw it. But in fact, the supernova had occurred, I don't know, I'm not quite sure, five light years, uh, uh, five year, years before that. And uh, so the experience started five years before, but no, it didn't. It just started uh, that morning. So the the time issue seems to be a nasty problem for the highly realist. It seems to force him to say that many experiences started long before. Uh, on the face of it, they did start. Right. Yeah, and it's it's very strange to imagine, like if you're viewing a galaxy that is millions and millions of light years away, that your experience started before you even existed. That exactly. just it seems absurd. Exactly. I didn't think of putting it like that. That's good. That's even better. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and... Uh, Yes, and I mean I'm I'm not sure they've got a good answer. I mean I, I I've talked I've talked to I mean, I, I've got colleagues in London who are naive realists, and I've talked to them about that. Bill Bill Brewer, and he says, well, it's not so bad. I mean, uh, uh, if I read in the newspaper, he says that uh, Spurs lost last night. In fact, they didn't. They drew, and I watched it. So, but let's imagine I read in the paper this morning that they drew. Then he says, look, my state of knowledge will uh, uh, constitutively involve the fact. I mean, knowledge is a fact of state. I mean, I wouldn't know unless it was a fact last night that uh, 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 Spurs did win. But uh, I only got into the state of knowledge, knowledge now today. And uh, so that, why isn't it like that? And I say, well... Knowledge is kind of different. Uh, knowledge isn't per se a conscious state. Uh, and I want to say that conscious states, we know where they extend in time. We know what the beginnings and end of conscious states are. And they don't have parts mm -hmm. that uh, were there before they started. Uh, knowledge can have a constitutive part that's there before uh, the knowledge title because it's not a conscious state, but I can't really make sense of conscious states being like that. And I'm not sure the naive realists have a good answer to that, that argument. I haven't seen one yet anyway. No, I am with you as you, as you laid it out, that, mm. that is a very pressing concern for the naive realist. And you mentioned that talking about naive realism will set the stage well for talking with, the the dominant theory the representationalist theory yeah how how do they relate does it overcome this problem of time lag or is it attractive for other reasons so this as i said look a standard view a standard objection to naive realism is that surely 
we want to allow that I can have just the same conscious experience, not only in cases where there really is a yellow ball there, but in cases where I uh, mistakenly see there to be a yellow ball there, illusions or hallucinations. Uh, I mean, as I said, the, the naive realist denies that. They, they want to say that, that there's one kind of conscious state in the good case and a different kind of conscious state. I mean, uh, and then they have trouble explaining what kind of conscious state it is in the, in, in the, in the bad case. I mean, they have to say you can't tell from ins inside which kind of conscious state you are. And my main objection to naive realism, just, just to go back to it for a second, is I find it hard to make good sense of the idea of conscious differences that ne can never be uh, discern from the inside. But anyway, uh, uh, the naive realist says that uh, there are these conscious differences between the good case and the bad case, uh, uh, and uh, the good case, what you have in the good case, isn't representing the thing out there. It's just giving you what's out there. There's no possibility of that state being mistaken. That state's constituted by by the thing perceived. But the alternative view, which wants to say, look, there's a common conscious factor across the good cases and the bad illusory cases, will then say, no, no, and, and think of that common conscious factor as representing there to be a yellow ball there, truly in the good cases, but falsely in the bad cases. And so this looks like a nice, a nice story about what's going on across the two kinds of cases that will account for the fact uh, uh, that you get to, if you deny naive realism, that there's a common conscious state across the two, across the two cases. So that's the idea of sensory experiences as representational. And okay, now it gets a bit trickier because everything I've said so far in in this uh, discussion has been in favor of the idea that sensory experiences are representational. Uh, uh, right. I said, you know, you're representing your cat to be there in the good cases and the bad cases. We're representing these two lines to be different lengths in the good cases and the bad cases. Uh, 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 thinking of sensory experiences are representational is, is an attractive alternative to the naive realist case because you've got an account of what's going on both in the good and bad cases that uh, uh, accounts for their being consciously similar. And, uh, okay, the issue we're going to come to now is that, uh, nevertheless, my book is a sustained attack on representationalist views of experience and the defense of an alternative view, which I call the qualitative view. So uh, right. while I think that sensory experiences are representations, and that's a very good uh, uh, counter to the naive realist view. I'm not a representationalist about experience. Shall I continue? But yeah, you should, I, I was going to ask, but why ask, not? <laughs> ask the question, ask the question. Let's make sure we're, we're, we're on, the, on the right track here. Ask the question. No, we are. I was going to ask, I mean, if mm. you view sensory experience as fundamentally representational and you don't require these higher cognitive faculties um, to make sense of it, then why on the face of it are you, I mean, it seems like you should be a representationalist. I guess maybe we need to flesh out just what it means to be a representationalist more to find out where the mismatch is. Good, good. So I said earlier against the Kantians and Reedians who think intuition needs the help of concepts to become representational, that I think that sensory experience, and I think I, I half stopped myself saying, is intrinsically representational. Uh, I think it represents, sensory experience is capable of representing without the help of uh, higher conceptual cognition and so on. Uh, I don't think it's capable of representing without the help of anything. And that's where wow. I differ from the representationalists in the philosophy of perception. 
they think that sensory experience represents purely in virtue of its intrinsic nature. And I say, no, no, it only represents in virtue of the way it's embedded in a wider environment involving our bodies and the external world and the relation between our bodies and the external world. So I use, I use an analogy at this point. Uh, an analogy is, is words in a written or spoken language. And I say, I mean, think of, think of the words I'm speaking now. If we had some words written on a blackboard, the example I use in the book is, is, uh, Elvis once visited Paris. I, I like that sentence because nobody's quite sure if it's true or false, right? So, so look, those, those words, and think of them as words written on a blackboard or a piece of paper in English, those English words. They represent all right. They say that Elvis was once in Paris and would be true if he was and false if he wasn't and they represent just fine their representation but they don't represent in virtue of their intrinsic nature i mean just those same words could have meant something different or meant nothing at all you know paris might have been called berlin or whatever i mean uh, uh, uh Berlin might have been called Paris. I mean, just those same words could have represented something different. I mean, they represent what they do, not in virtue of their intrinsic nature as marks on paper, but in virtue of the way they're used by the community of English, English speakers. And I want to say that sensory experiences are like words, that they represent all right, but not in virtue of their intrinsic nature. They represent what they do because human beings have been set up by evolution so that certain sensory experiences co-vary systematically with certain features of the environment, and that what makes them represent the things they do. The representationists in the philosophy of perception, however, have a much stronger view they think that sensory experiences aren't like words. They think sensory experiences represent just in virtue of their intrinsic nature. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's not an implausible view. I mean, maybe at first part of my view is, is less plausible than the, than the representationist view. But they think uh, you can just look at the sensory experiences, you can tell what they're representing without thinking about... Uh, what kind of environment the beings that have those sets of experiences are embedded in. Uh, uh, they think you just, just, you know, introspect the nature of sensory experience. You can tell just by looking at it, what it, what it must be representing. Whereas I want to say, no, no, it's like, it's like the words of the English language, just those same words could have represented something, something different. And uh, maybe we can focus the issue by thinking about cosmic swamp brain. Uh, uh, cosmic right? swamp brain? Cosmic swamp brain. You never met a cosmic swamp brain before. Imagine out there in interstellar space, uh, near vacuum, nothing much going on, just by random quantum fluctuation, we get we get uh, uh, intrinsic duplicate physical duplicate of me, my brain, inside a a uh, Boltzmann brain, a Boltzmann brain. But no, we'll have it kind of hooked up to a, a, a computer so that I mean, well, it could be a Boltzmann brain, but it's going to have the same. It's it's, it's going to have a it's going to have a, a sensory cortex and a, a motor cortex, and it's going to have the same. Uh, Afferent signals and efferent signals, as my brain has for about twenty minutes or so. And uh, okay, now uh, th th this is not meant as an argument. This this is just meant as illustration of the different positions. Uh, uh, I'm inclined to think, along with some, but not all, representationists. 
that that being will have just the same sensory experiences as me. It's got just the same physical goings on as I have going on inside my head. I take it that's enough to give it the same conscious experiences. But I say in that being, the conscious experiences won't be represent anything. They won't be representing anything any more than the, uh, 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 a picture of Winston Churchill drawn on the mountains of Mars by random Martian winds represents Winston Churchill. It's just, or, 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 or the, the words Elvis once visited in Paris drawn on the, the hills of Mars by the wind do not represent anything. They're just a random arrangement of, of bits of sand. And I want to say that the cosmic brain and the bat, its states don't represent anything. Uh, uh, but the, the representationalists in the philosophy of perception uh, want to say, no, no, it has just the same conscious experiences as me, and it represents uh, colors and shapes and so on, even though that brain has never been in contact with any colors or shapes or anything like that. So that's, that's the position. I want to think of sensory experiences like, like, like words that represent, but not in virtue of their intrinsic nature, whereas the representationists want to say that the the conscious nature of the state and its representational content are necessarily tied together. That there's an essential connection between what the experiences say and how they feel consciously. So that's that's the representationist position I'm against. So my intuition just after hearing this example is that I also want to, I think, agree with the representationalist okay. that, that this floating brain is having genuine representations in as much as the real David Papineau is. And I think for me to better understand the upshots of the qualitative view, I have to maybe hear the, the, what the problem cases are for the representationalist that aren't problematic for somebody who holds the qualitative view. Good. Uh, it's fine by me. I, I said when I was introducing the views that, that uh, the representationalist view probably has more support, if I mean, if not a lot more support from intuition than than my view i mean yeah i mean just just think about how it feels for you consciously when you're having visual experience or tactical experience isn't it obvious that that represents the world to be thus and so you don't have to know anything about about the history evolutionary history of of uh ourselves and indeed the cosmic cosmic swamp brain would have conscious experiences that represent that's that that seems that seems plausible uh I don't know if there's any knockdown problem cases. And I don't really argue from cases. I, I mean, in, in general in philosophy, I don't like arguing from intuitions about problem cases. And uh, and I said when I introduced Cosmic Swamp, man, this wasn't meant to be a matter of argument. This is meant to be right, a matter right, right. of clarifying what the positions are. And uh, it's very interesting with cosmic. So in, in this case, I mean, there's one intuition that it will have conscious experience and those conscious experience will represent. There's another intuition. Well, I'm not even sure. I'm, there's another position, which is my position, that will have conscious experiences just like me and they won't represent. And there's a third view about the cosmic swamp brain, which I haven't mentioned yet, and which is one that will be adopted by some representationists, but put them to one side, but I'll just mention it. They'll say the cosmic swamp brain won't have any experiences uh, because, uh, uh, well, we won't go into that, but they'll, they'll think, you know, well, the naive realists will say the cosmic swamp brain isn't having any experiences, or at least isn't having uh, our experiences. So so uh, intuitions about thought experiments are not going to cut any argumentative advice, but it remains the case that thought experiments are a very good way of clarifying the content of the views, making it clear what somebody is committed to. Ask them what they're going to say about that case. Brings out brings out the issues. I don't argue from intuitions about cases. I argue 
on metaphysical grounds. And I put a challenge to the representationalists. So representationalism from now on in our discussion, let's understand it as strong representationalism that holds that the conscious character, okay, now we need two terms here, conscious character is the way the experience feels, the what its likeness properties, the feely properties, how it feels. The representationists, the strong representationists say that the conscious character and the representational content are necessarily tied together. Okay, what's representational content? Representational content is what the experience says about the world. Just think of it in terms of the truth condition of the experience. Sometimes it's a bit odd to talk about experiences having truth conditions, the verticality condition, the, the accuracy condition. I mean, the experience uh, uh, says that P, it will be accurate if and only if P. It says that the two lines are different lengths. It says that there's a cat there. Uh, uh, and that's the representational content. And now the question is, the feeling that you have, feeling that what its likeness properties, that's one kind of thing. Uh, saying that the world is thus and so, typically the external world, I mean, the, the world, physical world around you, that's another kind of thing. Come on, give me a story as to why those two things should necessarily go together. And uh, at the start of the chapter that attacks representationism, I... I look at the standard arguments representationists give for their representationalism, and I say that doesn't get close to showing that those two things necessarily go together. I mean, it shows that experiences are representations, a lot of these examples, but I agree that experiences are representations. Uh, uh, I just don't think they're essentially representations. I think uh, we need some... Uh, account of why the experiences represent that makes them turn out a bit like words that happen to represent because of certain further uh, contingent facts that surround them, not in virtue of their intrinsic nature. So the, the argument against representationalism is a challenge for them to explain why these two things should go together, followed by... Uh, arguments that the kind of things they say about why the two things go together don't really stand up so yeah i think i'm beginning to change my mind <laughs> okay. and uh, let me let Good. me ask you a question so i am seeing another a connection here to a different area of philosophy maybe because you mentioned this elvis example but I'm thinking of Kripke's uh, causal theory of reference and mm -hmm. whether we would want to say that this brain, uh, the David Papineau swamp brain, uh, 5 million <laughs> light years away, whether even, it, even though it has your same conscious states, whether we want to say it knows anything about Julius Caesar. And my instinct is to say no in this case because even if its brain has these facts it has no causal connection whatsoever to julius caesar good and i'm seeing a parallel now to this uh, question of representation because as you laid out in this thought experiment the we're we're all in agreement, even the representationalist, the naive realist, everybody has to agree that the brain has the same conscious states. So whether or not something is a representation, if they if they have, if the brain has the same physical makeup, whether mm -hmm. or not this is a representation seems to me to be more like a question of what we should call a representation because we're not debating about what's going on in the brain so much and i'm now because of this this issue with the causal theory of naming i'm more inclined to agree with you that some we shouldn't call it a representation or it's not the sensory experience isn't representational if it isn't connected in the relevant way to um 
the Boltzmann brains, the David Papineau Swamp brains, uh, evolutionary history, its causal connection to what was being represented, um, all these sorts of factors. Good, good. I mean, that that's uh, quite the right right connection. And uh, Kripke, uh, the random P.F. Strawson, uh, Putnam, very important in developing the right way to think about, about representation. Uh, I mean, there's a sense in which Kripke around 1970, I mean, I'd say was a start, a big part of starting to think about representation in the right way. And I can remember when his externalism, his causal theory of reference first came out, Many people's first reaction, my first reaction, was that can't be right. If that was right, we wouldn't know what we were talking about. We wouldn't be in contact with the reference of our thoughts. And the presupposition there was that you can read off from the conscious nature of your mental state, which is accessible to you, what it's about. And that Kripke is saying, no, no, what it's about depends on how things are outside your head. And uh, that was the right thought, but it was a, a not a thought that, that chimed all that well with previous philosophical thinking, which was... Uh, essentially representationist. It thought that the, the representational content of, of mental states fell out of their conscious nature. So there's actually quite a lot of moving parts to the argument now. Let's, let's run for a bit with the idea that you just aired following Kripke, that What makes it the case that a certain mental state uh, represents such and such is something to do with how the mental state is related to further features of the external world. Uh, I mean, there's another line of thought, which is kind of biological thinking and representation, which is kind of consonant with the Kripkean thought, but not quite the same which is to say that basic biological phenomenon is that, that animals, uh, animals have brains to help them find their way around the world and the brains get into states that uh, you can think of as standing proxy for certain external states in the sense that they'll lead the animal to act in a way appropriate to the external states, right? So uh, you get signs of a tiger, you form a, 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 a mental state, the mental state then makes you behave in a way appropriate to the presence of a tiger, you know, run away, uh, uh, hide somewhere. Uh, and, uh, and that's what it is for the state to represent a tiger. Uh, you don't have to think of it as conscious at all. It's just an intermediary between the tiger and the appropriate behavior. But again, you know, what makes a state represent what it does is, is a kind of systematic relation between the internal state and the external circumstances. So that's, that's a naturalist theory of representation. It involves uh, uh, relations between the internal state and the external, external world. And not all representationists in the philosophy of perception are naturalists about representation, but quite a lot are. And the two leading figures in this area are, are Michael Tai and Fred Dretsky. Now, you might think that once you have this naturalist theory of representation, you, you wouldn't be specially inclined to be a strong representationist about sensory experience. I mean, your intuition, once you 
brought in the idea of representation in relation to the external world was that the cosmic brain and the vat wouldn't represent anymore. But I'll now tell you something slightly curious. Uh, Dretsky and Ty are so attached to the idea that sensory consciousness experience goes with naturalist representation. I mean, their program is to explain consciousness in terms of representation. So what is it for a state to be conscious? It's to represent the world in some fairly detailed, rich way. Once you've got that, you're going to have consciousness. Was it for a state to represent the world in some way? Now they're naturalists. It's to do with a correlation with the external environment. And so they conclude on this basis, the cosmic brain and the vat, uh, despite having just the same internal, internal state as me, will not be conscious at all because it doesn't represent, because it's never been embedded in an environment and representation is what's required for consciousness. Uh, I think that's an even stranger intuition than my intuition that it doesn't represent. See, we've got the three positions now. We've got, we've got my weak representationalism. We've got uh, the strong representationalists who say that just because the cosmic state is conscious, it uh, will represent. And then we've got among the strong representationists, the naturalist representationists who can see that the cosmic swamp brain uh, won't be naturalistically representing, uh, so conclude it won't even be conscious. And uh, uh, you might wonder what kind of representation do the people in the middle have, the ones who think it is conscious and so does represent. They've got to answer my challenge about what does representation have to do with consciousness, but uh, we might come back to that. So, okay, so the, 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 the representationists are starting to look worse and worse, I take it. But there's something else we could mention at this point, which is the so-called transparency of experience. Uh, do you want to talk about that, or do you think we've had enough on strong representationalism? No, no. I'd be very happy to continue talking about the transparency of experience and i'm guessing does i haven't heard this phrase before does it have to do with maybe the third person access to first person experience no it's not it's not that it's to do okay. with it's to do with The apparent introspectable nature of experience. It's all it's all first personal stuff. So we've just between us raised the difficulty for strong representationalism. If if representation as Kripke and the biologist suggests is is some kind of depends on a relationship between a internal mental state and features of the environment that it's related to. If if that's what representation is, then it's not so obvious how how representational content can be essentially tied to the conscious features of experience. We'd be inclined to think the conscious feature experience are all inside your head, and that doesn't yet uh, 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 involve any relation to the environment. So looks like strong representationalism is not a very plausible view in the first place, at least if you're thinking of representational in kind of environment relational terms. But despite that, there's a kind of line of thought that persuaded a lot of people over the past 40 years that, that representationalism must be right. And it's this line of thought. It starts with Gilbert Harmon, but there's predecessors, uh, G. Moore, 
it says, suppose you're looking, I don't know, I don't know what you're looking at at the moment. You're looking at a microphone. I mean, uh, 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 I'm, I'm looking at your image on the screen. No, no, that's too complicated. We've got too many images and screens and so on. That's going to complicate. Okay. I'm looking, I'm looking at yeah, a, I'm looking at the cat uh, now. I'm looking at a white cup. Let, let, let's focus on this white cup. It's uh, on the screen. Uh, and the line of thought goes like, like this. Look, you, Papineau, you're thinking of experiences as kind of internal things with a certain conscious feeling. I mean, and let's call those qualia. It's got qualitative properties, internal. I mean, qualia can mean all kinds of things in different contexts. I mean, don't anybody get – this is a, just a term I've just defined for the moment, the, 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 the way the experience feels, right? And so there's kind of features of the experience that are to do with how it feels for me internally. Okay, now Harmon says, okay, that's what's there. Why don't you – turn your introspective mind to those features of experience. Here you are looking at the cup, right? And you kind of got your mind focused on the cup. But now forget about the cup. Uh, think about the, the intrinsic qualitative features of your experience. And then Harmon says, I'll tell you, you won't be able to do that. All that happens if you start doing that is you look harder at the cup and its <laughs> whiteness and its shininess and so on. The only properties that you can find to attend to are ordinary, worldly properties of the cup. Now, I'll use worldly to refer to the kind of properties that physical objects has, as opposed to the kind of properties that you might think experiences have. And Harmon says that the only properties are, are to be found in your experience are worldly properties like circular and uh, white and uh, shiny and so on. And, uh, okay, and then this is supposed to be a kind of argument for strong representations about experience. And the thought is that present in your experience will be ordinary worldly properties. Like, look, I was looking at the, the white cup. I mean, a moment ago, I was looking at the yellow ball, so roundness and uh, uh, yellowness or the... the the hardness of the cup, the shininess of the cup, and the whiteness, those are the properties you find in experience. And then the thought is, well, uh, okay, and so those properties are in your experience, and what they're saying is that the world outside you instantiates those same properties. I mean, sometimes the world outside you actually does, sometimes it doesn't, the bad cases, but either way, those properties are in your experience, saying that the world outside uh, instantiates those properties. And so because the only properties in experience are worldly properties of the kinds that physical objects can have, uh, experience is intrinsically representational. What do you think about that for an argument? Uh, very influential argument. Uh, yeah, I, I don't really know what to say. I do find it somewhat, I mean, Huh? convincing at first glance i mean a problem case for this argument though is uh, the stuff of thought which seems very much to be internal and it, it does feel like you can focus very much on what's going on inside of your mind when you're not just thinking about perceptual experience i suppose uh Yes, that's that's more complicated. If you're thinking of non-perceptual thoughts, I right, close my eyes and I think there's a white cup over there, right? And so that's that, that's that's the the cognitive state. Uh, right. It's not clear that the cognitive state has any conscious feelings associated with it. I mean, that, that this is an issue about, is, is there a phenomenology to cognition? And some people it, 
there is and some people think there isn't. And look, okay, where we're going here is, is these people are giving a certain story about the, the transparency of experience. It's supposed to be an account or suggestion as to how experiences get to be intrinsically representational. And I guess your thought was, okay, I can see that kind of half works, but what about thoughts? They're representational too. Presumably you want them to be intrinsically representational if you're in this line of business, uh, but how's the story going to work for them? And some people say, look, no, so experience, I mean, so thoughts also have a phenomenology, and maybe some of them will say that uh, the, the phenomenology of thoughts involves the properties that are represented being present in the thoughts, and that's how the thoughts get to represent what they represent. Uh, I don't know. Uh, David Pitt is just uh, finishing a book on uh, uh, cognitive phenomenology, so we'll find out from him when it comes out how that's going to mm -hmm. work. But, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about when I maybe – and close my eyes or I don't even have to close my eyes. But yeah. if I imagine something white and I, I can really focus on this whiteness and it mm -hmm. is the subject or the object of my experience, but it's not located. Well, I mean, as physicalists, you and I are going to say that, yeah, it is located somewhere in the external world. That part of the external world just happens to be uh, somewhere in my brain, but there is no, whiteness to be found in my brain good good uh, that, I, that i'm zooming in on so and that's a problem for the strong representations to who appeal to the transparency of experience uh uh and it's most obvious in the case where you're hallucinating or having an illusion, right? So here we are, yeah. and I'm looking at something, and I have an experience as of a yellow ball, but let's suppose that there's nothing, nothing yellow there, and uh, – it's not quite clear how this property of yellowness is getting to be present in my experience. I mean, at least in the good case, the yellowness is nearby. You might have a problem about how something two feet away can be part of your consciousness, but I mean, that's not what no, no real, realists say. But it's even harder to see how the property of yellowness can be part of your consciousness when there isn't any yellowness nearby at all and your brain's not yellow, as you just said, and I'm not yellow, nothing's yellow. Nothing's yellow in the facility, yet yellowness is somehow present in my consciousness. And uh, the people who appeal to transparency will say, yeah, yeah, uh, it's there. It's there as an uninstantiated property. Somehow uh, uh, I'm an aware of an uninstantiated property and – that's what actually got me writing this book. I can remember uh, about 10 years ago or more, I, I can't remember why, but I thought, I, I mean, I'd never worked on the philosophy of perception before. I'd always kind of put it to one side. I mean, it's always had a lot of strange connections in the philosophy of perception to epistemology and uh, uh, contact with the world, which I didn't have much sympathy with. I, I, I never took much interest, but I thought I, I, there, might, there might have been some reason. I, I, I gave a four-week seminar on perception, and I thought I'd better look at these people. And, and I got to Ty and Dretsky, and and I read this, and we, you know, we had – this is a reading for this week. And I said, I said to the students, look, I can't make much sense of this. What are, they, are they really saying that in the case where I'm hallucinating uh, a pink rabbit, uh, the pinkness and the rabbit shapedness are part of my conscious experience? That makes absolutely no sense to me. It, it, it offended my naturalist uh, 
uh, scruples. And the student said, yeah, no, that's exactly what they say. And I said, you, you mean Michael Ty and Fred Dretzky think that? And they said, yeah, that's exactly what they think. And I, I, you know, I thought that's crazy. That's, that's completely crazy. That can't be right. And, uh, uh, and so then I spent the next, next eight years finding out about the philosophy of perception so I could write a book pointing out how crazy hmm. they were. Uh, uh, yeah, that's how it goes in philosophy. But, uh, yeah, well, this, this uh, I think issue... that's a strong case that that, that that it's crazy. I mean, in fact, I I have an argument in there, not not just. I mean, I start off by saying that's crazy. You, you can't really believe that, but I I do turn it into an argument. Well, you mentioned some of at the the outset of our conversation that some of these alternative views to the qualitative account mm-hmm. entailed. Uh, different conclusions or required strange assumptions that made them untenable. And while the inability to account for our, in the transparency of experience, our uh, phenomenology of whiteness when there are no white things around or why that might be representational is problematic. The idea that uh, your swamp brain is not conscious because it isn't representing anything is I think the most difficult uh, idea to accept for me that you've put forth uh, thus far. But I am wondering now what sort of objections you've received for the qualitative view and what sort uh, you maybe still anticipate uh, that other others have found uh, so that others have found untenable, so assumptions or conclusions that the view has entailed. Interesting. I haven't, now I think about it. I've had a few reviews. I mean, it, it takes a while for philosophy books to get reviewed. And there's a symposium just about to come out on the book in. Oxford Studies in the Philosophy of Mind. And there hasn't really been a response from the I mean most 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 of the reviews and comments have been have been positive. Uh few of them, I mean I don't quite know why, but there's quite a few from naive realists who are a bit impatient that I put their view to one side, but even so, they say they like my my arguments. Uh, Alex Byrne is the closest to a naturalist representationalist that uh, has commented on the book, and he objects to certain particular points, but he doesn't he doesn't mount a good defence of the central objection. Okay, the central objection to the naturalist representationist, which he's kind of a, uh, sympathetic to, is this idea that representation as they're thinking of it doesn't look like the right kind of thing to constitute conscious experience. In the end, representation, to be representing something, if I have the property of representing something, it's a rather complicated property that involves a relation between me and an abstract object, a proposition or a truth condition. And the argument I give in the end, I mean, it's kind of the culmination of this stuff about, come on, transparency, the property is really present in experience, is that the property of representing something, being in relation to a certain possible fact, a proposition, it's a very abstract kind of state to be in. It doesn't look like the kind of thing that has causes and effects. Whereas... Whereas uh, conscious experiences, they look like a paradigm of a thing 
that has causes and effects. As I say, they're here and now. Uh, they're caused by light waves impinging on me. They cause me to act in a certain way. Uh, uh, so they have a kind of meaty uh, kind of causal profile, whereas representational properties have this very abstract, abstract profile. And uh, right, that raises a question about uh, what role the representational properties themselves play in the unfolding of the world. And I say a bit about that. But the basic thought is these properties really, they, that was a challenge I raised in the first place. And having gone through all the arguments, they really look, they've got very different shapes. And all Alex says is, come on, why can't relations to abstract objects play a causal role? And he invokes the idea that uh, there was the, the fact that the number of explosions was three, that the explosions were three in number, uh, explains your your auditory experience. I mean, he evokes the fact that, 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 that certain facts involving numbers can have causes and effects. And I mean, I, reg I, mean, I, I should have spelt this out in the book more. I mean, I regard that as begging the question against my yeah. argument. My, my argument is precisely that, that uh, facts like that involve relations to abstract objects like numbers can't be can't be causal, and this is a familiar theme in the philosophy of mathematics. Uh, prominent, in right? Hartley I'm with Hartley you 100 percent on this. Hartley Fields' work, other work. I mean, you you've got to regard uh, the the bringing in numbers to specify uh, features of the world as a kind of coding that gives us a, a guide to what the structure of the things in the world are, but the numbers are just labels for that. And, and because numbers are outside space and time, they can't enter into causal relationships. So, uh, uh, yeah. So the naturalist representationists, I've not really seen them come back against my arguments. There's, there's another bunch of representationists we haven't mentioned, which are also quite prominent, but very different from naturalist representationists are the, Phenomenal intentionalists, that's Uriah Kriegel's label. He's kind of uh, done very interesting work pointing out that there's this kind of trend in the uh, philosophy of mind, philosophy of perception, philosophy of representation, which doesn't want to explain consciousness in terms of representation, but rather the other way around, wants to explain representation in terms of consciousness, which is the idea that uh, representation isn't a matter of internal states being correlated with features of the environment. It's something that f is special and falls out the structure of consciousness, and you can't have representation without consciousness. So, wants to explain representation in terms of consciousness. And kind of what I say in the book about that, and what many people say about it is, yeah, consciousness has a very interesting structure and it kind of feels a bit representation-y, but come on, tell us a story about, about how the, these internal feelings automatically lock on to something in the environment. What, what was your example of a Kripke external reference, reference to Julius Caesar, say? You, who was it you'd never been in contact with Julius Caesar? I mean, explain explain how uh, these intrinsic features inside the head, which got a certain conscious structure, uh, 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 lay claim to certain features in the external world. I mean, it doesn't have to be particular people like Julius Caesar. It might be uh, uh, certain... certain uh, properties, squareness, colors, and so on. And uh, the standard answer there is that, well, no, we don't really want to give an account of that kind of representation, representing truth conditions, external truth conditions. They can see that the intrinsic structure of consciousness is not going to give you that. So we're just talking about a kind of, pointiness that consciousness has that doesn't really involve truth conditions. And in response to that, I'm inclined to say, 
yeah, and consciousness is very structured and kind of pointy. And if it doesn't involve truth conditions, it's not obvious to me that it merits the term representational. At that point, uh, our differences become rather slight, and I find myself uh, uh, rather siding with the phenomenon of intentionality people, in that consciousness has an intrinsic structure, and that doesn't fix the external truth conditions. And our disagreements end up being pretty pretty terminological. So I guess what I'm saying is that none of the comebacks in literature so far have made me feel, uh, oh, uh, I, my arguments aren't as strong as I thought. Uh, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. We'll see. No, oh, that's good. Returning briefly, though, to Alex Burns' objection, I think yeah. that you and I are on the same page and that I am very much a, a good naturalist and materialist. Yeah. And I think the example that you gave, maybe paraphrasing something he said, was that the fact that there were three explosions yeah. uh, put you in such and such a, a state. Yeah. And you and I would want to deny the causal relation between your states and this abstract object. And I think like me, I just want to make sure that we're on the same page. Yeah. The way that you would deal with this example is you'd say, no, 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 it's not some abstract object. The fact that such and such happened that put me in the state, it was uh, these things happening <laughs> that put me in the state. And the 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 three explosions and our reference to the to the fact in uh language is just sort of a an act of expedience for no that's that's for not us. where i am i i i don't mind oh, okay. facts it was a number three i didn't like uh oh okay i'm i i grew up in philosophically in cambridge now we like facts uh the world is a totality okay. of facts, not things and Causal relationships are relationships between facts. I, mean, I don't think of facts as true proposition. I, I think of facts as just things in the world. You know, I mean, here's the cup and it's white, and that's a fact. Okay. Thing in the, uh, but it's, I'm it's, thinking it, of facts as true propositions. But if you're thinking of no, facts as things in the world, then we're in states of affairs. Then we're in uh, on the same okay. page. But Alex's thought was that just as The state of my representing something is a complex state that involves a relation to an abstract entity of proposition. So there being three explosions, to put it differently, the number of explosions being three is something that involves the abstract object three. And he wanted to say that so there's a case where abstract objects enter into causal relations. But I want to say, no, no, the abstract object three, the, the number three considered as an object, is outside space and time and can't enter into causal relations. Uh, uh, what caused me to have the, the auditory experience I have is that there was an explosion, and there was another explosion, and then there was another explosion, and uh, uh, anything that was an explosion run then was one of them. I mean, I'll, I'll give the quantificational version of there being three explosions, and that's a perfectly good fact to cause uh, my experience, but it doesn't involve the number three. Uh, so that's, I mean, that's uh, giving the Rossinian quantificational version of the number of the explosions being three, and I eliminate the number three from the fact that does the causing i mean you you might have have uh uh three being a kind of property that pluralities can have uh but then i'd say look in, in the book i distinguish between concrete facts the kind of facts that paradigmatically involve a physical object having a property uh, that i say enter into causal relations and abstract facts facts involving some thing outside space and time which i say can't and there are there are philosophy of maths account of the number three that do make the number three enter into concrete facts, but that's fine by me too. What Alex was trying to say is that uh, 
Abstract facts, facts involving entities outside space and time can enter into causal relations, and that I want to deny, and I think that's therefore a problem for uh, uh, strong representationist theories of, of sensory experience, at least ones that take representation to involve involve truth conditions. Mm -hmm. No, we're we're entirely on the same page with regard. It was just a, I guess, a misunderstanding on my part by how you were construing the word fact. But now that we're on the same page about facts, yeah, that's good. And then I also totally agree with you about the number three and how to deal with it. Yeah, no, facts were true propositions, and they'd be no good for for causing things either because propositions are are uh, abstract objects outside space and time. Yeah. Right. Well. Uh, David, as you know, uh, my intention was also to get to the philosophy of sports in your book, Knowing the Score. But I think that this has been very good and and self-contained, and we can save that for another time. Is there anything else that you wanted to say about the metaphysics of sensory experience before we finish? I don't think so. I don't think so. Read the book. It's available on, you know, okay. it's available on Oxford Scholarship online uh, and uh, uh, read the book and enjoy it. That's all I've got to say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks again. This has been a great uh, second episode and I really appreciate, again, your generosity with your time for talking with me. Not at all. It's, 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 it's fun being here. Uh, good to see you, Robinson. Hold on, Geeslings. Before you go, please uh, like subscribe, follow if you haven't already, smash all those buttons. And also, if you haven't followed me on uh, Twitter at Robinson Earhart, or if you're not joining me every morning as I eat my pint of ice cream on Twitch at Robinson Earhart on Robinson Eats, please do so.